So what a wonderful privilege to be here and to see this um, international gathering. Uh, my first international ICMDA meeting was in 2002, and it completely blew me away with this, uh, the vision of the, the, the global church. And um, as we're here, we recognize one another as sisters and brothers of the Lord Jesus and with a common calling to serve him. But, you know, have you ever thought about God's providence in placing you at this time of world history? You know, God saw you and knew you and loved you from before the foundation of the world. And he could have called you into existence and, and written a part for you in the great drama at any time. He might have called you to serve in the time of the, uh, the New Testament church with Luke the physician. Uh, he might have called you to serve him at the time of the great plagues, uh, sweeping through uh, Europe. Uh, he might have called you at the time of the great missionary expansions in the 19th century, in the early 20th century. But instead, God saw you and knew you and wrote a part for you in the great drama at this particular time of world history. A very strange, confusing, rapidly changing time. This is the time when we, God has called us to serve him. And it's a very unusual time. It's a time where we're all gr trying to grapple with immense changes. We've had this wonderful celebration, singing praise to God. And I'm rather sad to suddenly change the tone and have to talk about some really strange, difficult, uh, challenging material. But that's the way that God has, has called us to be. Now, let me see if I can make this work. There we go. So... As we know, artificial intelligence is absolutely everywhere. You can't uh, switch on the television, uh, go onto a news feed uh, without finding it. And these amazing hyperbolic statements, AI is the most important tech advance in decades. A chat GPT, this new phenomenon which is called generative AI, was the fastest growing software in the history of the internet. And this next slide shows how long it took for Spotify on the right, how long for Instagram to reach a million users, and there is ChatGPT, which did it in five days. And people are looking to the future and, and thinking, there's no doubt that AI is going to have all kinds of applications in our lifetime. and In fact, within the next years, we're going to see AI coming into healthcare around the world. Uh, we're already seeing rapid advances in, in medical image diagnosis. And th these machine learning systems are basically very sophisticated forms of pattern recognition. And we all know that pattern recognition is a very important part of clinical medicine. And these machines can do it, uh, in many cases, much better than human beings can. And uh, AI is going to have roles in all aspects of healthcare, not just in the rich world as well. There's uh, undoubtedly going to have uh, major impacts in low-resource countries, um, and there are many different uh, ways in which that may well happen. I'm going to be leading a breakout session uh, later on in the conference on particularly looking at health applications. So I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on that uh, in general. I want to more think about AI in more general in, uh, applications in this particular talk. There's the, um, the pr predicted market for um, artificial intelligence and particularly just the generative AI. But as we know, there are intense fears about artificial intelligence. And one of the uh, most prominent people who've been calling for a halt is Elon Musk, and, but many other leading names in the uh, industry uh, released an open letter uh, just about six weeks, two months ago, calling for a pause on AI. And they s said 
that AI represented a profound risk to society and even to the future of humanity. Some people are saying that artificial intelligence has now been added to other things such as uh, climate change and uh, pollution as an existential risk to the future of humanity. And just uh, not long ago, it was announced that ChatGPT had passed a major, major medical exam. And then the question was, well, if this does so well at medicine, do we actually need human doctors any longer? Next slide. So the big question is, what does it mean to be human in a world of intelligent machines? Next slide. As the machines become more like humans, one of the fascinating things is that the humans seem to be becoming more like machines. And increasingly, modern people tend to understand themselves as biological machines, even as information processing machines. Next slide. And so these are the kind of things we hear. He's hardwired to like music. Uh, she's programmed to obey her parents. I'm suffering from information overload. So even our language is reflecting the fact that this machine thinking has penetrated deeply into our consciousness. And so artificial intelligence becomes a distorting mirror in which we attempt to understand what it means to be human. And if you stop and think about that, this is something really bizarre, because who created artificial intelligence? Answer, human beings. And yet human beings are now using something that they created as a way of understanding themselves, as a way of trying to understand uh, what it means to be human. Next slide. That, that's a classic example of idolatry. And it reminds me of that wonderful passage in Isaiah, chapter 44, when Isaiah lampoons the uh, idolater who goes into the forest, finds a nice lump of wood. Uh, some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. But he also fashions a god and worships it. He prays to it and says, save me, you are my god. They know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see. Their minds are closed so they cannot understand. So here is a modern form of idolatry. When we create something, it, it actually, t we create it and it then starts to dominate us. It starts to change us. It starts to exert power over us. And I think that artificial intelligence is that modern kind of idolatry. Now, one of the really challenging and difficult areas about this, about artificial intelligence, is the role of science fiction. In all other, in, if you go back in history, the technological innovation came first, and then the creative artist came along and wrote or, or made plays about it. In other words, for example, um, the Industrial Revolution happens, steam machines are created, and then along comes Charles Dickens and writes novels about the Industrial Revolution. But what's been happening in this area is completely different. For more than a hundred years, creative artists, novelists, playwrights, dramatists, filmmakers have been imagining and hypothetical imaginary scenarios involving intelligent machines. And the interesting thing is that the majority of the technologists, the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley in America who are driving this forward, nearly all of them are, have been completely immersed in science fiction since they were children. This is the stuff that they've been reading and thinking and imagining. And many of them have very self-consciously said, we are dedicated to make this come true. And there are many examples where the technology that is being created today has been deliberately created to reproduce 
what pe people have read about in the science fiction novels. But then what happens is that the, la the later generation of science fiction authors come along, they see what the technologists are doing, and then they write new novels about what's happening, and then the technologists see what's writing. So a more recent novelist called Neil Stevenson uh, wrote a, a novel about uh, the internet, and he created this thing, theoretical thing he called the metaverse. And then along comes Zuckerberg and says, that's a great idea. I'm going to make that come true. So there's a very interesting feedback loop going on here between science fiction and the real world. And one of the things I suggest is this, if you really want to try and get an understanding of what is, going to, what is happening with artificial intelligence, you need to study science fiction. So, if anybody questions your reading, tell them that Professor Wyatt told you you need to study science fiction. Because, I'm, and I'm quite serious, part of the problem, I think, with Christians and Christian thinking in this area is that so few people have actually uh, are interested in the science fiction, and therefore we don't have the background of understanding about what's going on. And what's fascinating about science fiction, particularly American science fiction, is how frequently it is dystopic. Bad things happen. In fact, if you are reading a science fiction novel and the machines become more intelligent than the humans, you can virtually guarantee that it's not going to end well. There is this constant dystopic theme running through uh, science fiction. And I and many other people think that one of the reasons why the technologists have now come out and said we're worried about terrible things happening in reality is because they have been totally immersed in dystopic science fiction where terrible things happen, usually leading to the extinction of humankind or the enslavement of humankind by these super intelligent machines. And now they've been trying to make the science fiction come true and now they've started to get frightened that maybe they were a bit too successful and maybe it's going to go the way that the science fiction novels have gone. Now, of course, from a Christian point of view, we have a very different understanding. But nonetheless, the science fiction is really important. So you're probably very familiar with the, the left-hand side of this diagram. In other words, this secular evolutionary narrative of human beings emerging out of the African savanna by a combination of chance and um, natural selection and uh, gradually uh, emerging and homo sapiens. And, and the way this diagram used to be shown was that homo sapiens, usually male, was the supreme uh, focus of humanity. But increasingly, uh, thinkers are now suggesting maybe Homo sapiens is just a stage in this evolutionary pathway. Maybe the next stage in human evolution is going to be the machines that we've been creating. Um, so, so some people say, yes, we have our meat children, our, our children made out of meat in the same way as us. But the problem with our meat children is that they're always going to be limited. But we can also have our mind children. And our mind children are the machines that we make. And the, uh, the artificial intelligence, the robots, these are the mind children. And long after human beings have become extinct, our mind children are going to develop and spread and go across the universe. And some people have even suggested that Homo sapiens is a kind of boot code intelligence. A boot code is a short program which runs on a computer before it loads the main operating system. And so what's being suggested is that we human beings are just the biological boot code, but the main operating system is going to be the robots. Now that's science fiction, but it's very powerful science fiction. And uh, as, as Christians, we have as we'll see, a very different perspective. So, I think one of the take-home messages is that we need to think more deeply about the nature of technology, just to step back a bit. I think that 
as Christians, we often have a very superficial and simplistic understanding of technology. We think of it as this kind of neutral tool, like a hammer. You can either use it to build a house or you can use it to bash someone's brains out. But it's just a tool. It's, it's just neutral. It's an instrument. But in fact, we need to develop a much deeper thinking about technology. Technology, particularly this very sophisticated technology, is much more profound, much more uh, complex, and much more potentially spiritually dangerous than just a neutral tool. And the philosopher George Grant, uh, he's written some very helpful material about technology. He says that technology, the very word technologos, is, explains what it is. It is an interpenetration of making and knowing, but it's focus. What is the goal, the focus? It is the mastery of nature. It is all aimed to master, to control nature. And uh, both non-human nature, but actually we are turning technology on ourselves in order to master our very humanity. Next slide. Now, of course, there is an extremely positive aspect of technology. Right from the beginning chapters of Genesis, the creation mandates tell human beings to flourish, to fill, to subdue the earth, and to fill it. And so, taking the potential that is within the creation and using our human creativity uh, to, to, to build and create something new, uh, and something that's going to promote human flourishing and health and justice and compassion and wisdom. This is what technology is for. Th and this is what technology can do. And I, for one, was just blown away by what technology could do for us in the lockdown during the pandemic. I had the privilege of... Um, being part of the, uh, the group that started a, a bioethics training seminar. And we would meet on Zoom every week. And there on the screen was the body of Christ. There was the sister from India and, and the brother from South Sudan and, the, and the, the guy from Papua New Guinea and Brazil. Colombia and they were all there and we were able to pray together we were able to share at a deep level we were able to weep together and rejoice together and learn together and it was all because of technology and you know it, this made me think that in if we look back in the history of the church God has often used technology human technology as a way of furthering his purposes. In fact, you can go right back to the invention of a phonetic script. Hebrew was one of the very first phonetic scripts that was invented by human beings. And God took this newfangled human technology and used it as a means of communicating his deepest purpose and meaning to the human race. And then if you take the Reformation, people have often pointed out that the printing press, uh, the, when the printing press came, it, it gave a fantastic boost to the Reformation. It became possible for translations of the Bible in the vernacular to be circulated around the, around the world simply because of the printing press. And I wonder, you know, I'm starting to think that the Internet and Zoom and the possibility of, of talking over the internet is a gift that God has given to the global church to enable us to express our unity uh, in a new way, in a way which no other generations of the global church has ever been for been able to do. Christians have always known that in theory we're part of this wonderful body of people from every tongue and nation and tribe. They've known that in theory. But now, using this wonderful gift that God has given us, we can experience this on a day-to-day -day basis. I think we're only just starting to uncover the potential of what 
the internet can give the global church. And for all the other uses of the internet, perhaps in God's providence, that's one of the reasons why we've been given this, this wonderful tool as a gift. So yes, there's something extremely positive about technology, but, next slide, unfortunately there's a very negative side. Uh, technology creates its own distortion. It distorts the world. And it, and it makes us see the world in terms of objectification, in terms of efficiency, in terms of manipulation. Next slide. And what we're finding is that there are these fundamental drivers of automation. And that uh, these drivers of automation are this is what the technology does for us. And it provides increased speed, increased accuracy, increased economic efficiency, 24-7 operation, and, and rapid scaling and reproduction of effective technology across health systems and across the world. So one of the fascinating things is there doesn't appear to be a physical limit to the processing power of information technology. So in any physical system, there's a limit to how much technology can, can provide. But uh, when we're talking about digital systems, there's no limit. <laughs> I understand the minister wanted to hear the talk. And so and so that's the reason he, he's come earlier. And he's asked me to, um, to repeat uh, briefly, if we could go back to the beginning and just very briefly I'll recap. Um, so we live in an age of artificial intelligence, which is transforming the world in which uh, we live. Next slide. And um, we've already seen that artificial intelligence is, is being claimed to be the most important advance in decades. It's, it grew at an enormous rate. Next slide. This is just showing how rapidly uh, ChatGPT was taken up. Next slide. But there are uh, amazing applications that artificial intelligence can apply in healthcare. And artificial intelligence is basically a very sophisticated form of pattern recognition and therefore in healthcare it can bring many potential. The commercial potential is enormous. Next slide. And yet there is a great deal of concern about the risks. Many people are, are asking for a pause on the development of artificial intelligence saying is it going to uh, create risks. Next slide. And uh, these generative models, they've already shown that they can pass medical exams. And so people are questioning, are, is there going to be a need for human doctors? Next slide. So what does it mean to be human in a world of intelligent machines? And so as the machines become more like humans, the humans become more like machines. And increasingly modern people, we think of ourselves as biological machines. And so the, we say that people are hardwired or programmed or suffering from information overload. This just shows how these machine ideas have penetrated. So artificial intelligence is like a distorting mirror in which we try and understand what it means to be human. And this is like the image in the Bible where Isaiah says, he talks about a man who takes a, a lump of wood and half of the wood he burns to keep himself warm, and the other half he makes into an idol, and then he worships it. And so this is a modern version of idolatry, where a machine that we've made by our hands is trying to inform us about what it means to be human. Next slide. So there's this a very interesting interface between science fiction and the real world. And sometimes in this area, it's very difficult to work out what is actually science fiction, and what is genuinely happening in reality. And the interesting thing is that many of the people who work in Silicon Valley are science fiction uh, uh, enthusiasts, and they're trying to make the science fiction come true. 
And so one of the science fiction ideas is that as humans evolve, that we are not the final stage of evolution, but that actually we're going to go on and have machines who are going to replace us and they're going to be our mind children, the real successors. Next slide. So we need to think more deeply about technology and a way that it's orientated towards the mastery of nature. Technology is just not neutral. It, it carries within it some deep forces and potentially negative forces. Next slide. So yes, there's an extremely positive aspect of technology, taking the raw material and using uh, human creativity to promote human flourishing and health and justice and compassion, wisdom, the common good. And I was just saying that we, uh, in the pandemic, we discovered that the internet and the use of Zoom and the other internet uh, providers uh, was an astonishing gift that enabled us to speak around the world. And I was part of a, uh, a group where people were, were meeting around. Next slide. But technology has this negative aspect. It creates its own reality distortion field. It, 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 it potentially uh, opens us to manipulation. Next slide. So these are the drivers that, uh, that, that drive automation. And these are the drivers that we're going to find in healthcare. Because compared with human beings, so go, just go back to the previous one. Compared with human beings, the machines are always going to be faster. They're potentially more accurate. They have greater efficiency. They operate 24-7 without ever getting tired. And there is this phenomenon called scaling. Just imagine that a health system says, we need more doctors. We need 100 more doctors. To train a doctor might well cost $100,000 and take five years. So what will be the investment required? How long will it take to get 100 more doctors? But once you've got an artificial intelligence program, you can scale that up um, a hundredfold, a thousandfold, a millionfold, a billionfold. It would be possible to take a health software application and put it on every single smartphone on the planet. And so this scaling power, this ability to multiply at extraordinary speed is one of the, uh, the features of this kind of technology. But the, but the question, of course, is what do we lose when we uh, go by this direction? What, what are we losing? So there appears to be no, sorry, go back one. There, does, there appears to be no physical limit to the processing power of information technology. So all other technologies, there's a physical limit to how powerful it can be. If you take a steam engine, you can double it. And then as you try and make it bigger and bigger, eventually, there's no way of making it bigger. It collapses under its own weight. You could do the same with a rocket engine. You do it with a, the same with anything made physical. There is some physical limit. But when you're dealing with ones and noughts, which is how computers operate, there doesn't appear to be any limit to the power, the processing power that we could get. And that is what is making some technologies very scared. Next slide. So this is taken out of an academic textbook, believe it or not, by a, an Oxford professor. And the book is called Superintelligence. And so along the axis here, we have intelligence. So there is the mouse, the intelligence of a mouse. There is the intelligence of a chimpanzee. There is the intelligence of a village idiot, which is the sort of stupidest person who's a human being. And there is the intelligence of Einstein, who is the most intelligent a human being can be. So what happens when a super intelligent computer comes along that is so far beyond Einstein as Einstein is beyond the mouse? Do we think that this super intelligent computer is going to be particularly interested about human beings? Is going to be particularly concerned to protect human beings? Now, this is science fiction. 
but you can see why people are frightened. And this is um, the reason why, as people are projecting forward and saying, well, look, if you've made all this progress, and we extrapolate another year, and then another year, and then another year, and then another year, what is going to happen? How are we going to come? And therefore, Stephen Hawking has warned uh, artificial intelligence could end mankind. Uh, next one, Elon Musk says that our only hope is we've got to merge with the machines. So he read some uh, science fiction written by another uh, writer, Ian e M. Banks. And Ian e M. Banks had a a distant future where human beings were fitted with electrodes underneath the skull uh, called, and he, Ian Banks called it neural lace a fine network of and this would connect to computers well lo and behold Elon Musk has said I'm going to make neural lace and I'm going to make it happen and because the only way that we can survive as human beings is to merge and so he's created a company called Neuralink which is about connecting brains and AI systems. Unfortunately, there's a very dark side to this as well. This is not Elon Musk. This is the US military who is also doing exactly the same thing. And they have a vision of creating smart soldiers who would be able to, to uh, be directly connected into artificial intelligence systems. And so what's happening across the world is that there's a terrible arms race going on in military AI. Uh, with, with all the major uh, nations uh, investing large sums in secret research, uh, with the goal being to try to develop systems and particularly connect soldiers uh, to these AI systems. Just changing the focus slightly, um, one of the wonderful things about being human is our ability to anthropomorphize it's a, long, it's a long English word, anthropomorphe. It means to see a human form in a non-human being. And anybody who's watched a little child with their teddy bear or their doll or whatever it is sees how anthropomorphism is something that is very deeply rooted in our humanity. The fascinating thing is that it isn't under conscious control. It's something which just happens spontaneously. As soon as we see something, bang, our brains go, that's like a human being, and we anthropomorphize. So it's a part of our humanity. It brings profound positive benefits, but at the same time, it renders us open to manipulation and deception. And so what is already happening, and I think it's going to happen more and more, is we're going to be surrounded by simulated persons. Um, here is a software called Replica and is described as the AI companion who cares. Next slide. Uh, Replica is already, there are whole millions of people around the world apparently or hundreds of thousands using Replica and this, they talk every day to this AI companion on their smartphone and it talks back to them and um, some of them fell in love and, and they, they talk in an extravagant way about their relationship with the AI companion and then the company changed the software and people were absolutely devastated all of a sudden their precious companion had been lost uh, and so uh, and, and you know this is this is only the beginning imagine as this software becomes more and more sophisticated how what it's going to do to us and so this is a a journalist who said human compassion can be gamed it is the ultimate psychological hack a glitch in human response that can be exploited in an attempt to make a sticky product that's what the designers call a sticky product is one that you can't put down you're just drawn to it the whole time and that's what they're trying to do they're trying to create a sticky product and that's why designers give AIs human characteristics. They want us to like them. Next slide. And of course, this simulation, this ability to simulate is something which uh, potentially is opening up terrible uh, evils, uh, deep fakes. It's now possible uh, to take videos and use artificial intelligence to change the characters. Um, some people have already said that they think that 
within the foreseeable future, there's going to be major international conflict because of deep fakes, that there's, people are going to be fooled into thinking that there has been some attack, some onslaught, some, uh, some political change and so on. Next slide. This is another bit of science fiction. So there's a, a television program called Westworld on, on American television. It's, it's full of sex and violence, so I'm really not recommending it from the pulpit. Um, it, it's, it's got an 18 rating, but it does raise some very fascinating questions. So the, the theme, is, the science fiction theme, is that somewhere out in the American desert, a theme park populated by replicants, by highly sophisticated humanoid robots has been created. And real human beings can go to the theme park and can live out their fantasies with these humanoid robots. And in an early episode, a human being is coming to the theme park for the first time. And this beautiful woman comes up to him and says, can I help you? And he stares at her and he says, are you real or are you one of those? And she says, if you can't tell, does it matter? And that, I think, is going to be one of the hugely important questions that we're going to have to wrestle with in this new world that's coming. If you can't tell the difference from a, a very clever, sophisticated simulation and the real thing, does it matter? If the patient is dying and in pain and there's this incredibly sophisticated being that is caring and empathic and is saying all the right things, does it matter that it's just a very clever program? And I, as a Christian, believe passionately, yes, it does matter, that, we, that our commitment is to authenticity and to truthfulness and uh, yet I can think, I can see already that there are going to be many people out there that says actually it doesn't matter. As long as the patient doesn't, can't tell the fact that it's a sophisticated simulation, does it really matter? It's much cheaper, it's much more efficient, it's got all sorts of advantages. And so that's going to be one of the questions we're going to have to uh, address and debate as we look to the future. Next slide. Another thing I just want to reflect on is these, what are called these large language models like ChatGPT, which are now able to produce vast amounts of apparently intelligent language, just being created out of very sophisticated software models. And I think we haven't thought enough about, I think a lot of Christians have, have just adopted ChatGPT as a bit of a joke. I've already heard of people preparing sermons and Bible study outlines and all kinds of things, just taking ChatGPT in. And I have to say, I find that deeply disturbing because the very nature of this software is that it's a complete black box. You have no idea of how those words have been produced. And what we do know is that they carry within them all kinds of hidden distortions, biases, uh, and uh, potential manipulations. But isn't it interesting that how important language is in the Christian faith? The God of the Bible is a speaking God, a God who uses human language in order to communicate his deepest thoughts. Christ is the Logos, the Word. The Holy Spirit breathes, inspires the words of scriptures. And what's the first attack of the evil one in Genesis chapter 3? If you know your Bible, the very first attack of the evil one on human beings is language. Did God really say? So language is something that's incredibly profound and significant. And isn't it interesting now that these machines are just spewing out vast amounts of apparently intelligent but ultimately meaningless words pouring it all out um, and is it possible that the real truth the really significant words are going to get drowned in an absolute sea of uh, machine generated language next slide 
So whereas the earlier version of artificial intelligence has been used to control and dominate our attention, we all know how the smartphone, how social media, how these very sophisticated um, algorithms are used to dominate our attention, to, to get our notifications and uh, to, 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 to get our attention. But what's being suggested is that the new forms of generative AI that are able to produce amazingly sophisticated language, these are going to be used to, to control us through persuasion and through apparent intimacy. Because these machines are going to know us better than ourselves and are going to produce language which is so persuasive, so molded to exactly the things that will, that will manipulate us and that will uh, persuade us to change our behavior. Next slide. So the technology is new, but the power structures are very old and very powerful. Next slide. So some of the questions we're going to ask is how can we defend the essential dignity and the rights of human beings in these healthcare systems that are dominated by intelligent machines. Next slide. So certainly maintaining confidentiality and privacy. And we know that in healthcare, in areas of intimacy and vulnerability, this is an essential element of protecting vulnerable people. And there are real concerns about this new technology. The, the, the Silicon Valley uh, techno technological giants, they, they have not got a good track record in terms of confidentiality potentiality and privacy. What's going to happen when this, they, their technology, their software is being increasingly used in healthcare applications? Next slide. But I think we also need to f fight to maintain the centrality of physically embodied human-to-human -human interaction at the heart of our lives and in particular in these vital areas. Not only healthcare but also social care, in education, and in our communities. Next slide. So, you know, however sophisticated the program is, it cannot have, give you the solidarity of a human being. You know, and I think of the time I've had as a clinician sometimes caring for a dying baby, trying to support parents facing this ultimate tragedy. Medically, I had absolutely nothing to offer. But the only thing I had to offer was my presence that I could be there to try to be the hands of Christ and to say, I am a human being like you. I too understand what it means to fear and to suffer and to be exposed to loss. And I'm here to walk this path with you and to offer you my wisdom and my expertise, my experience, and to take a covenant, a promise that I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to walk with you on this path. Only a human being can do that. A machine doesn't know what it means to suffer, doesn't know what it means to be fearful. And it's that human solidarity, that human compassion is something that nothing can replace. So the, I'm coming to the end, but I think one of the other questions which is not asked enough, and that is what is the ultimate goal of all this technology? Where is it? What's the end game? What are we aiming to achieve? What kind of world do we wish to create for our children? Next slide. The, the techno-optimists have this wonderful glossy idea. You've probably seen pictures like this. This is what the future is going to be like. It's always bright. People are always smiling. Next slide. This is, this is the city of the future. You see the sky is blue. The grass is green. It's absolutely wonderful. The technology is there, guiding us, ushering us along. So techno-optimism creates a vision of the future in which human enhancement, intelligent machines mean that everything is frictionless. Next slide. Every desire, every longing, every interest will be satisfied instantly and effortlessly in this new digital world. Frustration, struggle, and boredom, it's all going to go. Instead, we're going to be free to fulfill our wildest dreams with the minimum of effort. But is this a future in which physically embodied human beings can flourish and find their ultimate purpose and fulfillment 
Next slide. If you've seen Wally, -E, the Disney movie, this is the vision of what happens to human beings in this utopian future, sitting on their backsides, staring at the screens, while all the clever machines do all the important things. So, in order for physical human beings who are created in God's image to develop, to mature, and to flourish, it seems that we need resistance. We need friction. We need struggle. We need perseverance. We need frustration. We even need pain. And therefore, the question is, how are we going to create, sorry, go, just go back one, how, how are we going to create technology? How are we going to create a future which enables these things, enables human beings to flourish rather than to, than to become dehumanized because all the difficulty, all the effort, all the friction has been removed from our lives? Next slide. Going back to this diagram, the great worry is of something coming along on the right-hand side of the diagram. But actually, if you think about personhood, what it means to be a person, a person is not the same as the intelligence dimension. Because if you think about them, is a mouse a person? No. Is a chimpanzee a person? No. Is a village idiot a person? Yes. Is Einstein a person? Yes. Are they equally people? Yes. Intelligence doesn't change the degree. You wouldn't say that the brightest person you know is more of a person than the uh, most unintelligent person you know. In other words, personhood is a different kind of dimension. And even if that super intelligent computer comes along, it won't be a person. Only human beings uh, made in God's image can be people. And so to close, the grand narrative of the Bible starts in a garden, but it ends in a city. It's a garden city, but it's nonetheless is a city. And a city is above all else an artifact, it's a product of technology. And so the Bible has hints that the technology of human technology, the artifacts that humans make, the very best artifacts, are going to be brought into the New Jerusalem. It says the glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into, of the pagan nations are going to be brought into the New Jerusalem. So we don't know in God's purposes what surprising things may come and how God is planning to use uh, the technology which is currently being developed. Next slide. And I think what's helpful is the idea that AI technology can be redeemed. It can be brought back from the territory of the evil one and used to fulfill its amazing potential to promote human flourishing and the common good and the good of creation. So that's our goal. Our goal is not to say no to technology. Our goal is to say how can technology be redeemed? How can it be brought back and used for good? Next slide. And so as I close some preliminary responses, I think we need critical vigilance. We need to try to understand the signs of the times. We need to watch and pray. Secondly, I've often been reflecting about the parable of the wheat and the weeds. I think it's one of the most profound and mysterious of the parables. That it seems to be God's plan that the good stuff, the wheat, and the bad stuff, the weeds, should grow together inextricably intertwined. At the end of the age, it will become apparent. They will be separated. The wheat will be stored. The weeds will be burnt up. But in this time, God's plan is for the wheat and the weeds to grow together. And that's why we need discernment. We need wisdom to try to identify the good and to resist the evil. And then finally, don't be afraid. It's so interesting in the Bible Time and time again, at particular incidents, when God breaks into, into human history, the first thing that he says is, don't be afraid, fear not. And it's easy for our hearts to give way to fear as we look at these uh, developments and we look into the future. But we can be confident that God's sovereign purposes are being worked out in history and we're called to be bit players 
in the great drama. Just close, uh, say that there's more information and resources on my own website called johnwyatt.com. Uh, there are a number of books, as uh, Peter had mentioned, and uh, a book, next one's got The Robot Will See You Now, uh, Artificial Intelligence and the Christian Faith, and then finally uh, I and my son Tim do a regular weekly podcast, which you can find on any podcast survival. Thank you very much. <laughs>